Um, anyway, Christian, thank you for, for being here today. Um, I know you're, you're busy and it's, it's great you managed to take some, some time to be with us today and we've got some lofty, lofty, idealistic things to, to chat about. Um, just before we get into it, um, for, for people outside your own network that might not know you, would you mind just giving us a bit of a, a, bit of a brief introduction to, to who you are, where, where you work, what you do, um, and, and you know, a basic understanding of what led you there, because that's often quite a, an interesting thing as well, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Um, especially what led me there, um, because um, I, I would say, yeah, just describing my journey might might um, actually be um, be the best possible way to talk a little bit more about myself. So, um, actually, I and originally I never really wanted to become a teacher, um, and and reason being is is um, um, I think the things I connected with teaching well obviously with everybody else based on my own school experiences, right? So, um, and, and, and my notion of teaching was um, something um, people do for a couple of years and then they get frustrated and grumpy and, and uh, <laughs> you have lots of people in the class that, um, uh, you know, have their hats down, you know, some participate and, and it's, you know, like, like something you have to go through yeah. to go to the next thing you have to go through, which might be university, which might be an apprenticeship, um, and, and, and then you uh, kind of um, made it by conventional norms. Um, obviously, right. yeah, obviously back then I, I wasn't as reflective about it as, as I might be now, but um, um, then um, during my days at university, I, I joined a student organization, um, ISEC, um, mm -hmm. you might have heard about that. Yeah. Um, and it was the first time where I was connected to, to a higher purpose, um, which was, um, Back then, I'm not sure if it's still a slogan, peace and fulfillment of humankind's potential. Right. And um, so basically it was about get, yeah, getting to know other countries, doing internships abroad or uh, volunteer projects. And, and there were lots of ways of um, you know, being engaged locally um, or, or regionally. Um, so, and this is the first time where I came across um, yeah, training workshops. So for me, that was like a totally different um, way of education um, in terms of, oh, there's somebody who's actually interested in what I have to say and what I'm doing and, and builds up scaffolds for, for me getting there and I can collaborate with other people. It's something interesting to work on and it's something I picked. Yeah, so I picked the workshop and I picked what I want to learn. And, um, and um, I was wondering, couldn't, couldn't school look like that actually? So mm -hmm. yeah, then, yeah. Um, Possibly the next pivotal point might be um, yeah, during, during my studies, I studied English American studies and, um, and linguistics first. Um, linguistics can be very dry. Um, yes. Yeah. With Especially all the... pr pronunciation, which hasn't, you know, hasn't really changed much. The study of pronunciation in about 20 years, it's the same diagrams yeah. and models. And... <laughs> oh, yeah, diagrams and models are found very, um, yeah, if, if you... Um, if you love languages, don't study linguistics. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I have to agree. Yeah. <laughs> this is my, my, my opinion. Anyway, but, but there was one there was one course though, um, second language acquisition. And the difference uh -huh. was that was the first time where it was about um, human development. So I found it so fascinating to get an insight into how, how the brain works, um, how um, actually things or like things that we find very complex get acquired organically over time, but also what you can do um, as a person to, to guide people in the process of, of acquiring new, new talents and skills. So um, and this made me to switch into um, a minor subject, teaching German as a foreign language. Um, and um, so, after, so after I graduated, I, I still didn't really want to be a teacher, but I, I wanted to at least have, have the opportunity where I can um, give, give value by, by creating learning experiences that are meaningful to people. That, that's the only thing I knew, whatever that was. Um, so I, I applied for an internship at an international school in Vietnam, originally just for, for three months. And I think the only reason I, I went there was um, that the mission they, they set for themselves was totally different than from, from uh, what I learned about school. So international mindedness, um, collaboration, 
yeah, recognizing the uniqueness in every person. And I also was so, so impressed by how how the, how the facilities look, because that's another thing, um, you know, how, how school buildings look like. Um, um, I actually just um, just uh, read a book um, or started Raise Your Hand by Koma Shah, which just came out. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've meant to read that. It's just come out, hasn't it? I've been following uh, Kamal on, on LinkedIn and it's just, it's a really inspiring story. Th th this is a work of passion, 100%. Definitely. Yeah. And one very interesting thing is that she said, at least in the US, uh, apparently many architects or designers who de design schools also design prisons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, oh um, my goodness. Yeah. So, um, and yeah, I ended up staying there for, for three years because um, I, I learned um, that, that, that teaching or at least taking a part into, in um, yeah, supporting somebody in, in somebody's growth um, can be something so, so rewarding. And um, to be honest, I had to, I had the moment of the battle because I, I, I still had my, you know, my, my own beliefs about education. But then, of course, when you when you work with, together with um, teachers who have been doing this for like uh, decades already, then yeah, yeah. You know, then as a young person, I, I I started to wonder. Okay, so um, they they must know better than me. So this is how I guess I have to teach. Um, and and this famous yes, slogan, yes. "Don't smile before Christmas." I actually got this piece of advice. So 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 if if anybody ever asked me what is the worst piece of advice anybody has ever given you, it, it's no smile before Christmas. Oh, I think that's a <laughs> that's a. Concept. I know I, I I relate to a lot of what you're saying there, and um, it's funny because it, you know we we've had actually quite similar backgrounds. I did my masters in applied linguistics. Um, I became a language teacher uh, as a foreign language, kind of almost accidentally. I never set out to be a teacher. I only did it because originally because it was a way to travel. You know, I wanted to see the mm. world, and I'm I've always been an addicted to traveling. You know, and getting out there and this seemed like a great way to sustain that and then you know discovered how much I, I loved it but your your exposure to that I mean particularly you mentioned being in a situation where you sort of realized the, the power of agency and being able to, to make your own choices and learning and how my goodness I mean that if you want to build agency and learners that's the, an obvious uh, basic minimum isn't it um, yeah. but also I think um, and I wonder if you what you think of this in Scotland or the, which is where I am, by the way, um, the, the teacher training programs for high schools, et cetera, they, uh, I don't know if they're still doing it for a while, they were prioritizing applicants that had done um, EFL, TEFL, that kind of thing, um, which made a lot of sense to me because I found that the way that we studied um, second language acquisition, because it's this combination of you know, psychology and pedagogy um, and even back in the 60s, you've got Noam Chomsky's black box and all this, you know, what's happening in the mind and, you know, really thinking about uh, empathizing with the, the learning process was, was way ahead of mainstream education, you know, because mainstream education has always been playing catch up with, you know, with psychology and, and other fields, um, you know, which have already kind of demonstrated certain things way in advance. But I felt like foreign language teaching or second, you know, English as second language, whatever, was always way more advanced than mainstream education in terms of classroom practice um, and, and the way that we acquired it. And then when I stepped into a high school and I taught in Sweden and I had very similar advice to you and it was all about uh, classroom management, which smacks of the prison system really, isn't it? You know, how do you manage behavior? Um, don't be too friendly, um, start off strict and then ease off, never go the other way. All of these things that felt counterintuitive to me because I you know I saw and I just wanted to connect with people um, but I had the same experience as you well they must know better maybe I'm just a young idealist um, yeah. and you come full circle because you go through all of that you realize it's a load of rubbish to be very blunt about it I mean I understand certain ways but those uh, that those pieces of advice are products of the system they maintain aren't they I mean behavior you know classroom management is important if you're trying to prop up a knowledge rich one to many uh you know approach to instruction um so they do go hand in hand but then you kind of come back round and you you know you get like a generation later and you're like hang on this is my instinct was correct you know i should yeah. never have questioned it 
Uh, is that how you're feeling now, now that you're in this position where you are now and you're, you're talking about social emotional learning, you're talking about creating positive conditions for learning. Do you feel like you, you've come back to reconnecting with what you originally felt in teaching? That's a fantastic question. And, and I believe I, I do. And I, and I feel, I think, more encouraged, um, more encouraged than ever, because um, um, I met so, especially in the last year, I met so many people who really want to make a change in, 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 in education and to talk about very similar things. They're all idealists. And an idealist is, um, I, I think, I'm not sure if it you know, has any negative connotation for some people. I think to some extent it does. Um, you know, you, yeah, you, you're, the, you're the dreamer, you're un unrealistic. Um, okay, but, but what does realism mean? Um, some, I, I'm not sure who said this. Um, realism is nothing, you know, realism is nothing else but in a social, yeah, socially acceptable form of pessimism or something like this. So mm -hmm. yeah. I find it very interesting. Because, which says more okay. about the person who expresses the framework of realism than it does about what reality uh, objectively is, because we see the world as we are, not as it is often. So what exactly. people say is reality, I often question that. In fact, I think it's very healthy to always question that. <laughs> uh, absolutely. And um, I find it very interesting when you talk about instinct, because um, um, like more and more I can, I can, I can feel like when, whenever I'm in a situation where I have the feeling, um, I'm kind of, I wouldn't, wouldn't say in, enforcing my own agenda in the classroom, that this is a certain kind of disconnect. I cannot really describe it. It's some kind of, um, yeah, some kind of weird frequency, but it's not like on a, on, on a, yeah, a very amiable or inclusive level other than when there are situations where we just are, I mean, it sounds blunt, but where we just have a, a human interaction uh, with, yes. with each other. And yeah. um, for example, last, last Friday, I, um, it, it's a, a project-based um, um, yeah, learning class, if you will. Um, and there was hardly any, especially at this point, the, the kids created different board games in, 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 in groups. And uh, it was so fascinating, just me walking around, asking questions, asking questions, reiterating, but never, never instructing. And, and the thing is, there is so much more depth in learning and, some, and so many more facets that the kids show that, you know, whenever a parent in, in a classroom that is aimed on streamlining and aimed at conformity, because then you only see, um, you know, what, what only see like yeah, a, a limited scope of of the of, of the student, and um, you know, then and then we have the discussion about a good student or bad student. I mean, there's no good or bad student. I mean, everybody is a everybody is a learner, and 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 good or bad is also just one measure that somebody not smarter than us decided to be the norm that is acceptable so yes yeah and, and this is it everything you're saying there just reinforces again this this feeling i've always had that the way forward is for everyone to just let go let go you know this idea of that it's like the more tightly you control things your your instinctive visceral feeling of when you enforce your own agenda on a class even if it's mm -hmm. a you know a very subliminal level you can feel the energy change when they're not directing it and you know and when it becomes a passive mode of instruction and i found that's only amplified by the progress of generations which you know go back 30 years ago the teacher may well have been the gatekeeper of knowledge because um you know they held everything in their head and you couldn't access it any other way you could go to libraries but you know how, how many of us really spent that much time in libraries and so you listen but now, if it's just a passive mode of instruction, you know, I can get that from pressing a button. They all grew up um, on screens. They know this. So, so again, it's just removed that one remaining um, reason to sit and passively listen. And I had the same feeling as you when working in a high school in Sweden that I had a very challenging um, classroom environment. Because I wasn't as experienced, you know, as I, I as I sort of later became, you know, at, at the beginning of my journey, really. Um, um, really kind of diverse group of students with lots of different backgrounds and needs and interactions and all kinds of stuff that I was like oh my goodness this is so different than I'm used to and I was teaching English and we were it was in the school curriculum 
And I was meeting them where they were. You know, I was doing like, okay, let's learn English through hip hop. You all listen to hip hop. So let's deconstruct hip hop and, and build all the stuff that I need to cover into that. And they're making their own raps. And then I, you know, I brought in my turntables and teaching them how to DJ and wow. all kinds of stuff. We, we had such good fun. But, and it was amazing until the last sort of um, part of the semester where I felt the weight of the system appearing again. Hey, we've got stuff, boxes to tick. And all the stuff we're doing like, doesn't really fit into those boxes. And now, and, and my persona changed and they reacted to, cause they're like, suddenly where's all the stuff that we loved? Why are we now, we've got to do this and we've got to take these boxes. And it just felt counter instinctual, counter intuitive. And I felt I was letting them down, but I also felt like, well, I, I feel like I let them down more if they don't get the grades that give them validation in this strange construct that we have around us, you know, and, and teachers are caught in this as well. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's so interesting. And, 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 I, and I found it very interesting when you, when you said how, you know, how the energy changed and how the kids noticed the change in you, because eventually then, um, I don't want to say use the word reality kicked in, but, um, but at least, you know, the, the um, external stakes of accountability, you, you're still, um, um, that are still there. Um, um, because, yeah, because for, for me, for me, it's exactly the same. And then it feels a little bit like, okay, now we don't teach kids anymore. We, we try to make sure they, um, you know, that, that, yeah, that, that, this, that, they, that the streamline is working, that they are working according to this one acceptable norm. Um, and yeah, I've, yeah, I, I, I realized, I realized this, this, this a lot about myself. It's also interesting um, the way when people talk, talk about, talk about kids um, in, in the classroom about, in, and the question is always is, okay, this, this doom was, was maybe, you said this doom was defined, but where, where is it coming from? And often it's coming from, um, you know, you as a teacher then have these external states of accountability. And then I realized about myself, I, then I operate from a place of, of fear in a way, uh, of yeah. fear not, not conforming to what other, ex, other people expect from me. And there's nothing wrong about, um, you know, other people holding you accountable for something. But, but the question is, am I operating from the domain of fear or from the domain of, of creativity and, 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 and abundance of opportunities? And, Mm -hmm. um comparing both i mean what is more powerful um yeah so yeah and fear is I, I never, mean, yeah. fear is a mobilizer as well i mean it's it's our response isn't it i mean i think that any when you're when you find yourself on the fringes of what you consider is expected of you, you know, these norms and you feel yourself at the barriers of these or the boundaries um fear is a natural response but then it's the question is what we do then you know now I, I look around and I see incredible boldness from the people who are saying no I'm going to step outside of this um, whether it is um, trying to make change within the kind of state mandated curriculum which I think takes just as much courage perhaps even more so than to step completely outside and say I'm going to do something new which I also greatly respect and you and I are both connected through Learn Life in, in Barcelona Sure you're aware of um you know the, the schools the real school budapest and the green school in bali and these places you know come out you, you'll have come across loni uh Bergfist doing a project-based learning yeah. in the schools in denmark all of these people high tech high you know they're, they're out there um doing something different to kind of push out from outside which is great but then you've got people you've got um you know people within traditional schools um, and I, I had a conversation just this morning, somebody saying that there are networks of teachers who kind of meet um, privately almost to just to kind of reconnect with people to feel like there's other people like me out there because they are sometimes the lone voice in their school um, saying, hey, something's not right here. And it takes incredible courage um, to push ahead with that within those environments. I have huge respect for people that are you know, they're sticking to it and they're saying, no, I, I know this is right. Yeah, it, it does take a lot of courage. And, and, um, and you know, I, I find it, I find it quite, I mean, I, of course, I, I quite find, find it quite challenging myself, even though I, I'm very fortunate to say that um, 
that um, you know while I'm currently working at that that you know that that self actualized learning this is the you know this is the the road we want to travel. But then as you said, um, that there are also the stakes of accountability given by by the state, and um, and you also have to work with these people uh, in in a so, way. So how are you doing it then? Because I mean, in your particular context, and you're in yeah. Hamburg, no? Yeah. Um, how are how are you doing that with to to kind of balance those two? I mean, are to what extent are they competing? I don't know exactly what the system is um, in Germany. To what extent you have freedom and flexibility? Um, where are the barriers? Where do you come up against the challenges? And and how far can you actually? innovate i mean where, where do you find it yeah that's a fantastic question um so so first of all um the way it's organized in germany every every federal state has its own education system so um with with overlaps here and there um so um i'm you know i'm i'm working in, in the primary school i personally feel that uh, but i think it tends to be a general norm that in the primary department you have a little bit more or in primary schools you have a little bit more flexibility to do transdisciplinary learning is actually encouraged, which is which is uh, one one great thing. Um, of course, but there are also things that um, boxes that you have to tick off. So how many lessons of this subject subject area need to be taught? Um, how from from what time until what time does the schedule need to go? Um, even though we already know that um, eight, eight o'clock is not the best time for teenagers to um, to be active and engaged. Um, yeah. We, for some reason, we still do that. I don't understand. I don't really know why. Um, and I haven't made any further research on that. But um, there, there are lots of boxes you have to go, how many um, formal assessments you have to do over the year. So, so there are some stakes of accountability that, um, and, and, and really uh, balancing that out, that's, um, that, that can be a challenge. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to do, especially in the morning, is um, when I look at my schedule, I try as much as possible to see this as um, a, a blank canvas, okay? So it might say on the schedule, okay, so these are the subject A, subject B, then subject C, the subject D, but I'm with the kids during that time and how I use that time, I'm trying to adjust or adapt as much as possible to what I feel the kids need or what the kids yeah or what, what the kids clearly need or what they tell me they need it's not always possible but it's yeah some small moments where um yeah where where i try to i don't want to say uh, hack but um that yeah allow myself some fluidity flexibility and um and and try things out which are not always working of course but um but then it's also about sharing this with other colleagues and I, I tried this out yeah so and that worked yeah. for me what about because no, nobody can do it alone. I, I can do it alone. A school cannot do it alone. It needs to happen within, you know, within an ecosystem. And, and that's why I'm, you know, I'm, I'm so happy about organizations such as Learn Life who, who um, un understand that this needs to happen within an ecosystem, not only with um, trained teachers, but with, with anybody who is, you know, who who knows and has the feeling that it's something in the education system need to change for, for the better to, um, yeah, to, to live a fully human life in, in, yeah, in, in, in not only in these times, but also in the future. Yeah, it's, it's hugely challenging. It, it really is. And, but I mean, you're talking about things there like um, openly sort of saying, well, I don't have all the answers, you know, to, to create a culture of learning is means saying that we're all learners, as you say. So, you're trying things out, you're experimenting, you're trying to innovate. And I mean, that, that's a healthy culture. And it, it's interesting, what you say about primary schools seems to be, you know, again, from within a sort of bubble of the industrialized world that I'm familiar with. And I'm aware this is not at all representative of the world. From the education systems I'm familiar with, the primary schools seem to be, you know, really to a large degree getting a lot right in terms of this new paradigm of education, you know, sort of developing agency. So it's play-based, it's experimental, it's you're developing agency, you know, you're you're learning to embrace failure, failure is learning experience, you're learning, you know, you're you're socializing in different groups. 
there's work on respecting diversity in the classroom there's you know all kinds of good stuff going on that you know they're, they're out in nature and um, many nice things and then it seems like the closer you get to the industrialized world you know which is of course why all this system was created you know to kind of make people function in this very narrow view you know this uh industrialized economy just as you get closer to that things just start to fall away and then suddenly um you're doing all this great stuff and then you get into high school you know towards the official exams and suddenly all the other stuff just gets cut out and you start to hear phrases like covering content which i've always hated we've got to cover it for the exams you know and all of these external pressures kick in and and you know of course going into universities it can be just the same, you know, the, the, the attention to kind of the, the true skills or the true space that people need to develop um, this kind of critical flexibility and evaluative judgment and intercultural competence and empathy and all of this stuff that, that is given attention in primary, you know, it just seems to fall away the closer you get to work. But yeah, these on the other side of that, all the companies, they're saying, this is what we're looking for, though. This is what we need. Um, I, and there's a weird disconnect. I don't really understand. I mean, is there not a lot of knowledge sharing between sort of primary school and high school systems in the, the state where you are? Um, I'm not really sure about that. Um, and, and, and I think um, when we talk about systems in primary and secondary, I mean, the, I, I think the, the fact alone that we rec you know, consider learning as something that happens within a certain, you know, within certain confines of of, of one box and then another box, um, that's that's definitely a thing to be scrutinized um, and 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 um, to yeah to, to use the most diplomatic words I can I can find for that right now, um, because like the, the the notion that I'm I'm, I'm always I'm always asking myself um, those 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 I sometimes ha have those moments where I where I question everything. Why does a lesson need to be forty five minutes long? Why, why do kids need to be separate by age? Why, um, why does, yeah, you know, why is in the timetable everything split up by those separate chunks? Why does a break need to be this long? Um, why? So, and and if you ask yourself that question, then 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 often you you realize um, that that there is this. You know, as, as as you said, this 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 disconnect, or that your instinct kind of tells otherwise. And often our, our instinct is, is more accurate than we think. If, um, sometimes we we listen too much to to logic or what we believe is logical, rather than to um, to, to our instinct, our intuition. And um, yeah. and and I do realize that when I'm together with the kids, um, e even more so than than ever before. When yeah, doing the project-based learning on, on that last Friday, which was in the afternoon. I mean, it was, it was, it was amazing. The kids were so engaged. I, I could completely take the role of the guide, give some nudging here and there and what, you know, and what um, games they came up with. I'm very, I'm very sure that the depth and the detail and the, and the accuracy and, 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 and the resilience to try again and try and try, you know, try harder, try, you know, try another time something, something fails. Um, asking other other others for feedback. It was such an organic process, um, and I think learning as an organic process. This is something a streamlined system based on on conformity is not really catering for. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, I remember. I mean, I mean, you know, as as a, as a small child. I mean, I mean you're learning all the time and, and then it would be like you know, your dad or your mom shows you something oh, okay that's what you're doing okay let me show you how you can carve this these these kind of things yeah allowing the space for this organic development and um yeah. and i'm actually i'm actually wondering how many people are or adults you know in this world live at really at the at the fraction of their potential because their innate drive to innovate to create to connect um, got suppressed, yeah, um, by by the system they grew up in. And often I, you know, I when I 
it's not about me blaming anybody. So because often people don't really know better. I mean, you know, we, we grew all up in the systems um, that, that we went through and we are a product of, you know, those systems as well. Uh, but at some point there needs to be this, this, yeah, I think it's fair to say awakening happen. And um, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm wondering if it's, I, I've been working on that this morning, actually I've been writing about this, um, this process of change, you know, um, again, super aware that we're within an echo chamber sometimes, you know, I, um, you know, you kind of talk to people who are quite like-minded um, and you can believe hey god it must be happening any moment now there's going to be a whole change you know but it's just not quite where we are but the out in the real the real world again to use that phrase um one thing that does give me hope is is i mean what you were talking about their project-based learning i've always i've I've come to refer to that as the trojan horse for change in education because i do feel like it's a microcosmic representation of all the big ideals and big principles that that I think a lot of us share about education, you know, about what it should be, but it's introduced in a very, relatively speaking, non-threatening way to mainstream education. It's become, project-based learning is becoming so much more acceptable. You know, I think there's a lot of uh, teachers still very hesitant and, and all that about it, but it's definitely getting in there. And then it gives, what it does is it gives teachers a way to, see what you saw on Friday, you know, that, that oh my goodness, I, I don't have to think about classroom management when they are absolutely engaged and engrossed in what they're doing. I'm genuinely uh, amazed at what they produce. I'm genuinely um, enthused by their reaction at knowing that what they produced was unscripted and it wasn't kind of coming out into one or two predetermined outcomes. Like, you know, people talk about case studies as if they are kind of... Um, open forms of learning when they're already predetermined. You're not the protagonist of this. This is already written, but project-based learning is true open protagonism, you know, and it gives teachers this way to like, to, to internalize um, what education can actually be like without having to rock the boat too much because with the skillful assistance of facilitators and experts, you know, to help bring it in and train the teachers and things like that, you're still ticking all the boxes, you're still meeting all the outcomes, you're still able to get through all the things you feel you need to get through, but in a way that doesn't sacrifice, um, you know, that all the things that we, we really innately care about developing in young learners. So I wonder, I don't know if you feel the same way. I've always wondered if, you know, there's, there's all, all revolutionary changes happening out there. It's all kinds of stuff going on, but for the change from within, I, I really am coming to think that project-based learning is probably one going to be one of the biggest drivers of change from within. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. What, what do you think? Yeah, that's, uh, um, that's an interesting thought, um, especially with, um, you know, um, it becoming more acceptable. And I feel I do see that. Um, there might be the danger, though, that um, um, because also in project-based learning, um, it, it can happen that it can be completely teacher directed. So if you approach it with the same mindset yeah. that you had, um, you know, as a as a you know previous mindset, uh, conformity, streamlined, one direction, um, then and if you then you just apply it to yeah to another activity. Yeah. So for example, say like um, all the kids just work on this one project individually. Um, then you might follow the steps, but then you reinterpret the steps as um, as a streamlined lesson plan. Yeah, this yeah yeah this can happen. Def- definitely happened to me when I did it, when I did it the first time, um, and I think it took me about um, yeah I, I I would say so the last couple of weeks and especially um, so it's interesting that we have this conversation now. What I saw happening. Um, last week this is where was the first time where I felt yeah so now now I'm kind of there now yeah so now I um, have a feeling that throughout the entire time I was with the kids it was a um, yeah natural human interaction Um, Mm -hmm. they completely engaged for classroom management was hardly necessary um, where they came up with lots of ideas on their own which I would have never thought about and thereby um, 
create opportunities for themselves in a self-directed way um, to to really go for deep learning. And um, yeah. in this yeah. way, yeah. you do not yeah. So in this way, you do not only tick off all the boxes. Um, you tick off more boxes than you thought of, and maybe even create new boxes that, that were not. <laughs> Yeah, there but before. that's that's organic, isn't it? I mean, th this yeah. is organic is is and this is what I come back to about, you know, I feel like um, and it's going to be the most difficult thing for institutions, um, whether it's schools, further higher ed, whatever it is, to learn to let go. But first, the process of unlearning has to take place that the way that we learned did not serve us as well as it could have or should have, you know, um, despite the fact that some of us might have you know, adapted well to those particular sets of circumstances, we must recognize that it's certainly not for everybody. It's only, it's only favoring certain kinds of people and um, letting go is going to be the trickiest thing. So what you've talked about, about the, the instinctive um, thing about, okay, to see this as a sequence lesson plan is symptomatic of that. It takes a while, doesn't it, to, to unlearn and to actually let go and say, to truly authentically be at the side. Um, and as you say, have, have a human interaction, but I feel like when you meet new teachers coming in to primary school, high school, whatever, this is the way they feel. That you know, this is they 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 know why they're getting into this. They know what they want to do. They know how they feel about it, and it's trying to create these conditions where um, we are not cynical about that, and we're not saying don't smile till Christmas, and you know. And I feel like the more that those just even things like project-based learning exist where you can actually be yourself i mean any anybody that feels like they have a, a teaching persona which i certainly have felt like that uh, you know i I, felt, I worked in a business school for many years and i went skateboarding with my students after class cool. and <laughs> it took me sometimes like half an hour an hour to almost it was like changing the chip in the head you know of not being the business school director and being the skateboarder in the park with them. Um, and I've had to reflect on this a lot and try to work towards a point where, you know, I am the same person in all interactions and in all situations and that there shouldn't be a teacher persona and a home persona, right. you know, because if there is, that says something, not just really about you necessarily, but about the context in which you're operating. And when you find a place where you can be authentically you in all situations, I think that's when people are, they get the best out of themselves and communication is authentic and empathetic. Do you sometimes feel that, that in, in, in situations where say you are your, um, you know, business school director or, or the teacher that you're rather playing or acting out a role rather than um, being yourself? Yeah. I mean, I, th I think this is, um, it's exactly coming back to what our, both of our early experiences of teaching were. It's counterintuitive. It's the expectation. Now you are in X role, you must behave like Y, you know, mm. and no one else around you is saying any different, you know, which is, uh, you know, so, so, so you think, well, it must be me. It must be my naivety or idealism, you know, and that's when idealism does get stigmatized because you're a dreamer. You're not, you know, you're not being realistic and practical and, or oh, just you wait, you'll learn and all these kind of things that people say to you. But actually, you know, our instincts were, were right, I think, you know, and um, it takes a while to, to learn this, but I think this is why it's important to have, so the conversation we're having now and a million like them, whether it's through, you know, books like Kamal's book or, you know, the conversations, the articles, the podcasts, the, the conferences, the networking groups, the networks of teaching innovators, the, you know, even if you're the lone person in that school that thinks, hey, this is not right, we shouldn't be doing things like this, find your tribe, you know, as, as Sir Ken Robinson would say, find your, yeah. your tribe and connect with them. Because I feel like that's the way to sustain the energy to make change. And I wonder, you know, who, who's around you? Do you find that um, without, you know, obviously going too much into your, your colleagues and things, do you find that around you, have you seen a shift since you started, since those days of Don't Smile Till Christmas? Have you felt like the, the teaching cultures around you are more aligned with progressive approaches to education now? Or are you still finding the old resistance prevalent? Um, interesting. I need, to, I need to think about that. If I compare it with my initial experience, 
in my experience now. I think there have been always, there always have been progressive voices. I, I certainly see it much more than, um, than ever before, but there's lots of things that um, I think for the reason we talked about where people um, I think don't feel confident yet enough to take, take the step and, and, and go, yeah, go beyond their, their, yeah, maybe their limiting beliefs or, or what they learned um, to be, yeah, what, what they learned or what they thought the acceptable way of teaching is supposed to look like. That's um, just change has to first come, yeah, first teachers need to change. There needs to be a, yeah, per personal growth and personal change happen in teachers first, um, yeah, before, um, before you can do that uh, in, in the class or in the school by extension. And um, I, I would say, I would say I do, um, but I would rather describe it as, as um, yeah, maybe as a, yeah, maybe as a battle. I think, I think change, you know, it's, I think it's incremental and minimal. And I think, um, what, what sometimes I think people are afraid of is this change seems so, so massive. It's, it's so different you know, having an education model that it is aiming at, um, you know, human centeredness, self-directedness. It's so different from, from the previous model or where we all learned to teach that the task seems to be too massive to take on. And, yes. um, and, um, yeah, I think the you think also there's a vulnerability in there as well, because you said human centeredness. So that there we're moving beyond, um, you know, that when you're when you're imparting knowledge, there's able to be a barrier. You're able to maintain that perceived power distance and, you know, sense of hierarchy and social order and whatever, because you're simply transferring knowledge, you know, and you're maintaining authority and all that. When you start talking about um, these so, well, social emotional learning. Basically, when you start talking about that, um, you cannot help but reflect on yourself. And yeah. I, I, we can't assume that, again, it, I, I feel like this is a possibly, I, I don't know if you share this, but it's, this has been another form of transformation that's happening concurrently with education is a greater awareness of mental health, of you know, our own emotional self-regulation, you know, of the way that we interact to each other and a greater propensity to reflect as well. More people journaling, more people, men in particular, finally men learning to talk about feelings and, and share. All these things are kind of changing around us, um, which may be why there's more of this kind of talk in education because people are able to open themselves up and say, well, this is, if I feel like this, then I want other people to, have the same opportunities you know but do you think there is a maybe a sense of vulnerability in if we start opening education up to actually think more holistically about a person then that means exposing myself and that means I can't maintain this teacher thing anymore yeah um exactly and um um because you know being vulnerable mean you you yeah you need to reveal sides of yourself you may because um in the beginning like when i was being vulnerable i always felt i let my guard down and um and exposed and perceived as a as a weakness um for example say if, if i if i make a mistake um you know supporting supporting the kids and whatever that is and and actually um it's so much more powerful if you do not put yourself on the pedestal because what happens if you make a mistake and the kids see that, depending on how you respond to it, what the kids will see is, okay, there is a person who is not afraid of failure, who takes it with grace and takes it with optimism, posit positivity. Is it not something that might be more helpful for me to, um, to take on as well? So it's much more about how you showing how you respond to it. There are lots of things happening in the class that you know, are potential, potential stresses, which are uh, in reflection, not big problems, like the projector is not working or um, <laughs> this market or whatever that is. And um, something that helped me is to either turn this into a game. Um, yeah. 
I don't know, count, counting back in twos until it turns on, <laughs> something like this. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, okay, let's all look for the marker. Let's see if can we find it. Hmm, where might that be? Or um, well, this is when the true skill of being an educator is revealed. This is when the, the instincts are sharp, when you can just do that on the spot. Yeah. And, it, you know, I found it's like a muscle, actually. Like if you're the longer you're out of the learning environment, you know, I, I remember dividing people into two groups, like seeing, you know, you're looking at something, you're like, this is not working. OK, guys, let's let's do this. Uh, you guys sit there and you guys sit there and and not actually knowing what I was going to ask them to do but knowing that by the time they sat down, I was going to have an idea, you know? Yeah. Um, whereas you step out of that for a while and I went back into a learning environment and I found that those instincts were no longer nearly as sharp, you know? And I wonder, um, that's another part of letting go, isn't it? It's when, once you get into the, in, the, the, the open fluidity of learning, it means, it means making mistakes. It means laughing about stuff and saying, oh, the projector's yeah. not working or I forgot my USB, what are we going to do, you know? Or, um, and, 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 and dealing with it openly without trying to pretend. Um, and I think that's a thing that potentially some teachers do have a bit of fear around as well. The lesson plan gives you security, gives yeah. you structure, you know? Um, and so on a wider scale, so does the curriculum. You know, it's... You know, I have something to follow. Um, so I wonder if teacher education is also potentially at fault, because if, if we're not producing large scale, you know, um, teachers who feel confident in themselves to be able to go with it and adapt to the fluidity of an organic learning environment, then, I mean, you, your own teacher training, what, what was it like? You know, what did was it very organic or was it? I mean, did it prepare you for this or did you learn this intuitively? So what I always find interesting is that um, all the things we're talking about, I feel um, educational research has been knowing for, for years, maybe even decades. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and um, for, for, me, for me, the biggest change was when I had to write all my lesson plans and submit them. And that was, um, I, I honestly, I hated it. Um, yeah. Um, writing now so from minute one to minute five this is happening from minute five to minute seven this is happening this is not how how it works i, I mean um if i want to be a computer programmer um uh, yeah i i need to pursue a different degree then but um <laughs> and um yeah. that that yeah that that was just lots of busy work and because because something can you know like in real life something always comes up and the question is how do you isn't, more, isn't it more important to have the capacity to deal with challenges, to deal with adversity, to take it with humility and, and, to, and to be then creative and innovative? Yeah, when something doesn't work, do you have the capacity to problem solve then? Yeah, in, yeah. in, yeah, in, in that situation. And just because this plan fails doesn't mean the lesson is unsuccessful or learning didn't happen. Maybe it even happened more because now you and by extension the classroom you are you're working with has another on another way to solve a certain problem that they were yeah. not aware of so um the opportunities are there if you um yeah if you allow enough openness i still find it difficult um, and and you know i'm working on that every day to find the best balance between um uh, structure and, and fluidity and openness um yeah but I, I realized, at least what lesson planning is concerned, to me, it helps if I have an overarching idea what, what the yeah. outcome might be, the anticipated outcome, and some steps I know I can take to support them whilst knowing if that doesn't work, then I need to be okay with it and, be, and have the ability and capacity to problem solve, even together with the students, um, of how we can do this. So... Um, yeah. And the more that they are directing the sessions, um, the less you've got to worry about it, doesn't it? I mean, if you if you set up structures um, well, and I mean structures purely organizationally, um, you know, and, and, and within that it's completely organic. I mean, it's great walking into a session like that where you know, even when you arrive and they're already there and they're already setting up and they can't wait to get started and they don't actually 
you know, you can dive out for five minutes. They, they don't need you to be there. It's just better if you are. So you're enhancing the session, but you're, you know, they're not depending on you. That to me feels like when, when you know things are working, you know, and when there's space to iterate as well, because that's what life is like. I mean, life doesn't, life's not linear. And I mean, how can we say we're preparing learners for the real world if everything is safe and scripted and predictable and because it's definitely not out there. <laughs> no, no. Um, yeah, um, I think it was um, Robin Chalma who, who sa said, and maybe he quoted this from somebody else, but um, nothing is as dangerous as staying in the safe harbor of the known. Um, yeah. Because frameworks and, and society yeah. and, and, and the world and, and things that we thought to be true yesterday changes on a constant basis. And um, things like automation and everything becoming more digital, that doesn't have to be scary. Um, it actually can be a chance that maybe even liberates us of, of not doing things anymore we dislike to do. But then the question is, yeah, um, um, yeah what, where does it leave the role of education? And, and, I, and I believe 100% that we need to go back. To, it's actually interesting when we say go back to, <laughs> when we talk about the future, but, but to... Mm -hmm but to rediscover what it means to be, to be fully human. Um, mm -hmm. because, um, many jobs changes and jobs go away and doesn't have to be a bad, a bad thing. Um, I'm not sure if you know, things like universal basic income will mm -hmm. be there or not. Some people say it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And the yeah. thing is, what do you yeah. do then with your life? And um, I think if you don't have a sense of who you are, um, what you're passionate about and, and what you can what you can give to the world, it's gonna be it's gonna be like living the matrix because then other people will tell you and and mm -hmm. um, and I'm not I'm not I don't think that this is the desirable life um, to live. Yeah. So I feel like we've kind of reached that point. I, I do. I wonder, and again, you you can tell me if I'm being an idealist here. Um, because if you think about what's happening, you know, you, so you've got the, the seismic jolt of the pandemic, you know, which upended education and, and whatever happens when the dust settled, it did give people a glimpse of these, these structures are only a thin veneer. They are paper thin. Mm. And beneath this, there are older orders of things. There are older social constructs of the need to belong, the need to self-actualize, you know, things that are, they go way before theories of education, before the behaviorists started making us, you know, memorize and repeat and all this kind of stuff. There was, there was already things there. So we saw the, the cracks, you know, and, and whatever happens when we go back, there's also all these other changes happening. And you've got even the big companies saying, um, look, will you stop sending us people that are just coming out with absolutely no life skills, if you want to call it that, or mm. they just accept everything they're told. They don't know how to filter and critically evaluate things. And the inter interpersonal skills are zero and intercultural competence is limited and all this kind of stuff. This, these are the things we need. So because the old excuse used to be, oh, school is like this because you need to get ready for employability. But now, you know, the indus industry is saying we you know, it's changing. Uh, as you see, you know, AI, mechanization, automation of things, uh, it's so unpredictable. People are going to be changing careers all the time. You're not going to work for a bank for 30 years. You're going to, you're going to change a lot. You're going to be working on projects or with flat hierarchies with, you know, uh, bosses who are on first name terms. And, you know, these old constructs are disappearing um, and just education is not quite reflecting it. So I, I do wonder, it's just kind of, when you know it seems like it's just this hanging on to this standardized testing and hanging on to this how do we measure things and even then you mentioned it perfectly there the research has known for many years and I talked to um, Jennifer Groff a couple of weeks ago from Learning Futures who mm -hmm. has a quote that I've used I've used I've stolen it completely she said um, we no longer have a knowledge gap in education we have a fear gap um, mm -hmm. and I think it's been that way for quite some time Fear gap. Uh, a fear gap, yeah. So we're, we know exactly what doesn't work. We know why it doesn't work. We know what the solution is. We know how to measure, if you want to put it that way, you, you know, things outside standardized testing, how we measure personal competences and skills and things like that. We understand how to do those things now. 
There's ample evidence. Everything is in place. We just need to actually do it. You know, and we can do it. Um, and I just wonder when this is going to happen. Is it going to be next year? Is it going to be in 10 years? Um, but I feel like this change is, is imminent. I mean, the world can't wait any longer. No, you know? and, um, and, and, and uh, it, yeah, and it will come sooner or later. It will come. And it's, um, um, and I think those people who, you know, try to, to venture out right now and, and make this change happen, um, um, I don't want to say that they're all pioneers in the sense, maybe yes, but you know, somebody needs to be the pioneer. Somebody needs to be yeah. um, the first one and hopefully inspires others in the way. Um, I'm, I'm wondering also, I mean, we talked about fear before um, where, where this is coming from. Um, sometimes I wonder whether the things we talk about right now, whether it still happens within this ivory tower. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and maybe it, it's not yet reflective of, you know, broad conventional belief. Um, I mean, I, I definitely yeah. get the feeling when I talk about education with, um, you know, with other people and, um, and mm -hmm. I can't blame anybody because that's the only thing people know. And um, yeah. Yeah. so I definitely feel sometimes I'm, I'm, I, live in a, <laughs> I live in the clouds or I live in the ivory tower. So it feels very refreshing whenever yeah. I conversation such as this yeah. but, but I, I feel the same way I mean and um, I, I do I am aware and I, I'll never I'll never be convinced that, that that what I feel is representative of broader consensus you know I know that the research reflects it I know that you know the evidence reflects it but in terms of the broad way of thinking um, the, the, the problem can be that a lot of these advances and innovations in education only increase the inequities in society. You know, they, they lay them there. So, hey, technology is advancing and all these people are learning through augmented and virtual reality and blah, blah, yeah, but how many schools can afford that? How many countries can afford that? You know, we've got these small innovative schools. Okay, but how much do they cost? They're amazing, but lots of people can't access them. And so I'm very aware that, um, you know, change is nothing without equity. It's, it's nothing without equity. So there are the larger social conversations around this as well, you know, about ending inequality and privilege um, because education can never truly serve everybody unless that is ended. So I am aware that that's the other thing. It's not like, um, you know, our, what our environment looks like, you know, like Germany and Scotland, I think, you know, these, these systems, they are changing. You know, we're, we're getting rid of the, uh, the Scottish Qualifications Authority is disappearing after the OECD report was quite unkind uh, mm -hmm. about that aspect of our system. You know, people are responding. You know, we've got some really good people in, in education here in Scotland who are really blazing the, you know, the way. But to what extent will that filter down to real change on the ground um, in sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia in, you know, what, what, what's happening there you know that's the other thing is when we talk about change I'm aware that even if and when it does come it may well be limited to you know to our immediate industrialized um, environment yeah that that's yeah that that's that's a fantastic question it, it also sometimes feels like to me that that at the moment this seems to be more reserved for the privilege you know something extra fun to tinker with um, yeah. But yeah, but but how but how can it be broken down that really everybody can benefit from that? And um, I'm not sure if you um, if you watch that. It's it's, it's a, I'm not sure if that's still on on Netflix. Um, Daughters of Destiny. No. Yeah. I've seen that. So um, it's um, I watched this a well I think two years ago, and it's about a school that was um, set up in in I'm not sure where in India but that caters to families who belong to the case of the um, so-called untouchables who would never have any access to any kind of education. So I'm not saying that the school is like project-based learning or in innovative, but I think it gives a perfect example of what is possible if you give people who never had access to it, access to this, um, you know, to this you know, facilities or this opportunities that there were people who, you know, were basically on the, on the bottom, bottom scale of society were able to 
go to university, um, study law, and then use this new power to serve the community. Ah, this is yeah. This is one thing about 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 that school. So whenever you send your child there, the expectation is once you graduate, you have to use your um, skills and abilities to give back to the community. Um, right. So and then then you know this makes me wonder. So how many people are currently out there who 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 would have you know who who could be the next? I don't want to say um, you know Einstein or um, you know whoever we consider to to be um, you know a mastermind in this world um but cannot do it because there's no opportunity there and you know it's not only waste of potential for themselves but also by extension for uh, for the community and, and for the world yeah so yeah and this is it's, when, a, it's self-harm basically i mean yeah. this is self-harm is, is that you know it's the same with um sort of gender inequality as well i mean you're 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 disenfranchising you know half of the world's population you know um, and, and of course, and then you get sort of economic inequalities, racial inequalities, um, you know, there's just so much out there that when you look at the scale of the challenges, you know, we're on course for, you know, more than one and a half degrees warming, climate catastrophe, a number, you know, potential social breakdown in certain areas, food shortages, forced migration, tons of stuff that are just going to be beyond our comprehension at the moment. You know, how are we going to solve this? We need everybody on board. And if we're going to maintain the best kind of the ac access to education for just this small subset of the population, the world's population, who, by the way, also happen to be the ones causing the crisis <laughs> in the first place, you know, this is where global warming is coming from. It's not coming from, you know, the Gambia, it's coming from the US and, China and you know so it's just um it's absolutely ludicrous that we wouldn't broaden access to education and say hey look this needs to end we need everybody to have a shot at this um and the the, the, the good thing is that with the right sort of training and and belief system in education and the right um knowledge sharing and support um you're really looking at a situation where, I mean, technology enriches education in many ways, but it's not essential, you know. Um, Learner-directed approaches to education can happen with absolutely nothing else. You know, you can, you can improvise, you can, you know, these things are out there. So those things are transferable. And then when you're talking about um, giving back to your community, I mean, if we're talking about really making education more person-centered, uh, more uh, more about the whole person, but also more empathetic. And, you know, talking about global citizenship, talking about shared humanity, talking about empathy, talking about things that trans transcend all of these, you know, almost artificial divides of, you know, culture and race and things like that, that are, you know, that really we can do a lot better than this. Then we might find more people coming out of industrialized economies, thinking of their community, not just here, but globally and thinking, I need to get involved. You know, we're we're not going to get through this until we're all equal. So I'm going to go where I need to go and do my thing, do my bit and contribute. And I, I hope, again, I, I feel like education can provide this. It can open those doors, you know, um, get us thinking about the wider world and our responsibilities to future generations and, uh, and to the people around us who don't have what we have, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's definitely true. And it's, um, um, it's basically, I mean, the alternative would be, of course, yeah, not, not doing what we're doing, but then what would the outcome be? And the outcome would definitely not be, um, I think, a world you want to live in, or I want to live in, or, or anybody wants to live in. Um, and um, so one, one person once told me that, that, that the teaching is actually a kind of political activity or, or or way of engaging and um, not in terms of party politics mm -hmm. but in terms of looking at where society is where it's headed and what can I what can I do to make it better and, and to help yeah and help yeah. To, to yeah to to be fully human in you know within those changes that happen and um, yeah and, and 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 to live a fulfilled life in that society so um, and I, I really I really like this this notion yeah and, and, and I hope that more people think the way that you do. I mean, you've got um, 
these young people right now, you know, in your school, in your charge and care, who have their whole lives in front of them and the influences that we can help them to access at this stage and throughout their lives are going to be vital to them and being able to self-actualize, but then also feeling like discovering what they have to contribute. And that's the great tragedy because I feel like, um, you know, if people are not able or not given the space or the conditions to discover what, what sparks them, you know, what sets that flat, that fire, they'll, they'll never know what they can give back. They will never know, you know? Um, and that is again, such a wasted resource. There's just so much waste, you know? And if we're talking yeah. about designing waste out of our linear system, uh, that needs to filter into education too. We need to think about continuously cyclically giving back um, the greatest form of empathy that we've never somehow managed to transcend is empathy with future generations. It's still so abstract to us, you know, but it's clear. It's right here. If we don't develop this, we're done, you know? So. Yeah. De yeah, definitely. Oh, that was a bit of a, a gloomy note to finish there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let's, let's all finish on the, on the, on the, yeah, let's not finish on a gloomy note, though. Um, Tell me who inspires you, you know, um, to finish off then. I mean, who, who's inspiring you? What are What's giving you energy to, to continue? Because, I mean, obviously, the, the, there are those big challenges out there. Where are you getting the energy from to, to continue? So I'm, I'm getting the energy from, um, yeah, from, from those exceptional people out there who... A little bit maybe like like myself um confined themselves for a long time until they found their calling and now give give value to the world um one one great example is um i'm not sure if you know mind valley yes uh -huh. yeah so yeah so it's, yeah, so it's the founder of mind valley vision lakiani for example uh, this is a person who's truly inspiring me because the level the level he's thinking at is beyond anything that i'm aware of so whatever he brings out there and, and and you know he and his organization they are transforming education as well i mean more for adults but it it, it touches everything that is that is um you know around being being fully human and um that's very inspiring to me um somebody who has the courage and the bravery to yeah go for the unconventional and and doesn't and doesn't mind the ridicule and 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 it proves that that he is he's right. I mean, there's a, a huge following created from that. Um, um, a person like this definitely in, inspires me. Um, then um, you know the the people who work at Learn Life, they are they are a big big inspiration for me um, about yeah their courage, their bravery to to change the world for the better. Um, I think I think I can yeah I, I'm very sure I'll find a couple of examples more but these will like be, be the first people coming to mind. Um, then um, it's a podcast I listen to very frequently. Um, Jay, Jay Shetty, um, yeah. So um, who lived who lived uh, who lived like a monk for uh, three years and 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 came back and and um, and found his own path to uh, talk about men yeah. Not only mental health, but also finding your own pur purpose and passion. There, there, there's so many great people out there, and and once you so yeah, people say you're always the average of, of the five people you surround yourself with. <laughs> so, um, for me, it's very important to be conscious of of who that is, and yeah, um, yeah. and um, it doesn't have to be people you you personally know. Um, of course, that's that's the added bonus, but um, these are the people I'm yeah. I'm reaching out to I'm accessing. Um, then um, another thing, I'm, I'm not sure if you saw that on my LinkedIn profile, um, everybody in the in the Lifebook community, Lifebook is a, yeah. is also a very, very huge movement, uh, more than 60,000 people. It's not, it's not just a program, it's also basically a movement of people who want to bring consciousness into their lives and want to make a change in themselves, who see the importance of, of having a vision for their own life and live life as that resonates really with their inner desires and longings. And I think um, this shouldn't be just for adults. Um, I think we, can, we cannot start sooner enough to encourage everybody to stand in their truth, um, to celebrate their uniqueness 
And because if you do that, then you can give much more um, to, to others naturally than if yes. you confine yourself. Um, and it would be so exciting to see um, how, how the world would look like. Yeah, well, that, that's enough to draw energy from, isn't it? You know, yeah, you, definitely. It, it's true having those people around you. I mean, we mentioned vulnerability earlier on. You can't help think of, of uh, Brené Brown and her work on that. And, and one thing that she said is that um, she, only, she only takes advice from people who are, in her words, in the ring, you know. <laughs> so people who are on the sidelines and, and basically not doing anything to move things forward, their opinion is like wind. I mean, it's, you know, it's be careful not only who's around you, but who you take advice from, who you allow to influence you mm-hmm. as well. Are they in the ring? Are they, are they challenging themselves, you know? Um, have they experienced things, that, the changes that you're trying to be part of? Um, I think that's really, really important as well. I'm going to check out the Lifebook community as well because it sounds incredible. Yeah, it's beautiful, and um, and I'm and I'm very happy that that uh, since the summer um, I started collaborating with them, and and now I I facilitate those those experiences for for adults as well. Um, mm-hmm. It's more than a learning. It's it's not. I mean, the learning and the growth that is happening in that in that process. And um, there's one very beautiful sentence by um, by Sri Kumar Rao, who who said that. The, the point of having a goal is not the goal. It's about the growth and the learning that is happening in us and to us as we are building yeah. forwards. And, um, yeah. and that shouldn't be just for adults um, who discover this so much later in their life um, yeah. and in their 30s, 40s, 50s. Why not fostering that straight away? Yeah. So Absolutely. Absolutely. It's part of letting go. Learning's never done. You're never done. Everything's fluid. You know, you can set goals, but the overarching goal, I mean, there will be another one behind it. You know, it's it, it's empowering, I think, when you finally sort of get that and say that just lifelong, this is this is just enjoy the journey. You know? Exactly. It, exactly. And it, it, it's um, if, if you're obsessed without, you know, if you're obsessed with a distant outcome in the future, but you but you hustle your way through it. The likelihood of getting there is is possibly even less, and um, yeah. it's really so important to enjoy every minute of, of of the learning process, and and also see the failures, reframing as opportunity, um, mm-hmm. for further growth, and um, so yeah. when, and celebrating yeah. learning instead of yeah. obsessing about failures. That's yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Well, now we're on a positive note, Christian. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> we turned it around, yeah. Okay. Listen, thank you so much. Uh, it's been an amazingly enjoyable discussion, just um, just throwing some big ideas around and um, and hearing just hearing back how, how you're framing things as well. It, it really helps me as well. You know, just um, we've had similar experiences, but you've, you've sort of made me sort of reflect on them in slightly different ways and you know give me a couple of things to check into there's just small shifts I can see as, I, as I'm talking to you which is great you know so I've really enjoyed it yeah th- thank thank you so much as well I'm, I'm really I'm really um I feel really honored and, and humbled by um yeah by by the opportunity to talk to you and, and everybody by extension who is who's checking in and and watching or listening to that and um, yeah, I mean, these conversations are so crucial um, to have, and and I and I really hope that this can serve as, you know, a, a little nudge to, yeah, to to help people to either reaffirm what they always kind of yeah. knew to be true. Yes. Um, that's most of the time for me, but also to um, maybe feel encouraged to look beyond, and that's what I personally love the most. I always love when I presented with a new concept that challenges my own that makes me see my own limitations yeah and see oh there's so much more <laughs> yeah and there always is yeah. <laughs> there always is yeah it's yeah it's never ending yeah well thank you so much christian appreciate every second of your time and um thank you for the experience and um can't wait to speak to you again yeah thank you um my pleasure okay take care of yourself thank Bye-bye. you bye now